I am always so thankful for the privilege that Eric gives me from time to time to be able to share a message with you. It is generous on his part and kind of him to allow me to have the opportunity to share with you. You know, from time to time, things are entrusted to our safekeeping by other people. Perhaps along the way, someone has entrusted their home to you to watch over it for them. Uh, maybe you have house sat before for someone while they were traveling and you were careful to take care of their home on their behalf. Or maybe they loaned their car to you and you were given it in trust and you were to take care of it. Maybe it was a family pet that was entrusted to your care for a period of time. Or maybe as you think through the issue of things that have, of value that have been entrusted to you, maybe you think of that in terms of the spouse that has been given to you. Or perhaps that's the way that you consider the responsibility that God has given you related to your children, that God has entrusted to you that responsibility. There are different things that are given to us in trust for which we must give response but one of those things that is given to us sometimes is a message. And that message is an important message. And we need to treasure it and value it and be faithful in overseeing it. And that is where we are together this morning. And so I've entitled the message of today, A Message from the King. Because that's really what we want to talk about. You know, all through the Bible, we have different messages from the king that are given. Some of these were earthly kings and emperors who proclaimed things. For instance, in Exodus 1.22, it says, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. A royal proclamation. John, or Jonah 3 7 of the king of Nineveh. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water. Or Daniel, the third chapter, verse 10. There the counselors of the king are saying, You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And then on over into the New Testament, we read in Luke 2 these words, And in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. All of these different royal proclamations made and they've continued down through history some of them have been of great importance others of them a bit more frivolous perhaps for instance in the 16th century in the late 1500s when elizabeth I was reigning in england she gave a royal proclamation it was called proclamation of the uh, uh, Articles, uh, statutes of apparel. Okay, statutes of apparel. Sounds weighty, doesn't it? She gave no less than eight proclamations on the theme of excesses of apparel. And this morning we're considering a message from our king, the king of kings, the lord of all creation. And it's a, it's a good message. It's not a threatening message. Even as on the birth of Jesus Christ, the angel said, Fear not, for I bring unto you good news of a great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. So we have been given this wonderful message from our King. But you see, then we have a responsibility to do something with that. If you're a believer here today, then the message today is meant to clarify and to encourage you to carry out what God wants you to do. And if you're here today and you're standing on the outside looking at this thing called a relationship with Jesus Christ and you've not decided yet, 
you're trying to figure it out and decide if that's something that you're going to surrender your life to, then I want you to listen this morning because God has a message for you in the context of the message today. Now, in order to share this message, we're going to divide it into some parts, and I'm going to ask that uh, a couple of my grandchildren help me out. We've, we've already had Abigail helping, and now I'm going to ask two of my other grandchildren to come up and help me out with this this morning. And uh, I'm doing it because I really am a firm believer in the fact that, that if you see something, you can't unsee it. And uh, so I want you to see something this morning that hopefully the Lord will imprint upon your heart in such a way that you won't be able to unsee it because it contains a truth from the Lord. Now, in order to do this, we're going to play some roles. And I assure you, this is not typecasting as we take on these roles. <laughs> you can know that because I'm going to be in the role of God the Father. And Noah is going to be in the role of Jesus. <laughs> and Aiden is going to be in the role of Adam. Okay? <laughs> and so this whole story begins a long time ago, way back in the garden, you see. And in the garden, there was this fellowship that existed between man and God. There was a face-to-face -face relationship, and they dwelt together in a wonderful unity. Beyond what we could perhaps even imagine, there was this sense of oneness between them. But then into that garden setting, Satan came. And when he came, he came with lies. That is his stock and trade. And his lie was such that what God had said would happen if man chose to disobey Satan said, it won't happen. You don't have to worry about that. And in the process of that, man, having weighed his options, chose to believe the lie. And when he chose to believe the lie, he turned away from God. You see, because the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned unto our own way. We've turned away from God. The Bible says that your sins have made a separation between you and your God. And that is, in fact, in reality, the essence of sin. You see, sin itself is when we separate from God. We embrace sin into our lives. We take it on, and that becomes who we are. And we're controlled by that. But it's interesting that as we consider the fact that man turned away from God, God did not turn away from man. The heart of God never changed. Though man began to believe things that were no longer true, God's heart was always a heart of love for man. And the fact is that he was wanting for this relationship that he intended between him and his creation man to be restored. But he knew that man could not do that himself. And so he, through his great love, purposed that it would happen by sending his son. But you see, the problem was that man, in taking on this, this sin, didn't really understand all that he was taking on when he took on the sin. Because his life began to reflect the consequences of that sin. You see, in the garden, man, having taken on that sin, experienced, in that moment of his sin, he experienced first and foremost the fact that he was now guilty before God. There was that guilt that he had taken on. But not only was there guilt... But there was also now shame. And not only was there shame, but now man's life was going to be controlled by fear. That was the way that he would live his life from that point forward. 
and he had no really other choice to do that. He was enslaved and bound by those realities in his life. And the fact is that even if he desired to be able to turn back to God, he couldn't do it because he would be acting out of the realities of the lies that he had believed. He thought, well, maybe I can repair the relationship with God. But you see, that would have been fear driving him to a prideful reaction. If you're controlled by fear in your life, it normally manifests itself in one of two ways. One is by pride, self-promotion. I want to make myself look better than I really am. Or self-protection. I need to guard myself in the midst of the dangers of the world. But man could not make the repair. It was not possible. And you see, the Bible really reflects this reality in the garden. As Adam and Eve had sinned, listen to what it says there in Genesis, the third chapter, verses 7 to 10. It says, but your iniquities have made us, or excuse me, it says, then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. So there's guilt. They knew something had gone wrong and that they had done other than what God wanted. And it says, and then they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And so now they're bearing this sense of shame. How can I cover up this that I've done? And then it says, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. All of these things being manifested by man, and he could do nothing about it. But God in his great love chose to send his son, and he said, I can fix this problem that man cannot fix. And he did it by taking all of the guilt that was upon us, all of the shame that was upon us, all of the fear that controlled our lives and bound us, even the sin itself. And the Bible says he laid the iniquity of us all on Jesus Christ. Jesus himself took unto himself all of our sin. The Bible says he bore our sins in his body on the cross. And the fact is that we read in the passage this morning, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Having taken that sin upon himself, Jesus on the cross was there as an innocent man. He had never sinned. He had never broken the relationship between him and his, his father. But the fact was that he took that upon himself, our sin, our brokenness. And he bore all of that on the cross. Even as he hung there, he sensed what it was like to be separated from God. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That sense of aloneness that he was experiencing there upon the cross. But the Bible says that having borne that to the cross, he suffered the ultimate consequence of that, which was death. He died. And in that moment of his death, all of our sin was paid for and taken away. Because Jesus Christ was the innocent, blameless Son of God, God was not content to leave his Son in the grave, and therefore, by his power and glory, he raised Jesus from the dead and restored him to his place in glory with himself. But man had not yet been fully reconciled to God. You see, the word reconcile means to bring things that are separate back together again. To bring things that are apart into a unity. And so God, by his Holy Spirit, sent that Spirit 
to help man in his need. And he helped him in this way. He first of all brought him to the place of confession. Confession means to say the same thing as it is man speaking the truth about himself. When you confess, you're speaking the truth. And it comes a time in our lives where we need to be able to say, that's me. I am the one who has not trusted God. He told me how to live, and I have not trusted him in this regard. And that's confession. But then the Spirit of God comes, and he also brings us to repentance. And repentance is us turning from the way we've gone and turning back to God and opening the door of opportunity for us to come back into relationship with God the Father. It's a wonderful reality that God has brought about for us. And the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, because he's here now because of what Jesus had done, that's the only basis by which this relationship can exist. He's now bound in Christ to a relationship with the Father. But he says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And here's what happens in that newness. God sends his Holy Spirit to dwell in the life of that person. And that Holy Spirit now enables him and empowers him to do what before he could not do. He could not fully trust God. He could not and would not fully obey God. But now he's been given that capacity. And that is the truth, the message, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Give them a hand. They helped out wonderfully. Okay, so we've come to that point where now we understand what the message or what the truth is but now we come to the place where we need to realize that there is a message and the message is be reconciled to God God entrusts this message to us or at least it seems to declare that in 2 Corinthians 5 that we read earlier it says and this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation therefore we are ambassadors for Christ God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now the critical question relating to that that I just read is, who's the us referring to? Is Paul speaking of himself? He's the one who penned these words. They originated as the Spirit inspired him, and so he's saying, God's given me this responsibility or maybe he's thinking in terms of the apostles those who first knew him believed and he's saying God entrusted to us this message or is the scope and breadth of what he is writing there such that it extends to everyone who's in this room who is a follower of Christ and he's saying to us that I am appointing you as my royal ambassadors we still have ambassadors in the world today. They're assigned by a government to go and represent that government in other places in the world. And that's exactly the role that God has assigned to us. He has said, I am sending you forth into all the places of the world, to the darkest, deepest, most difficult places. I am sending you as my ambassador and an ambassador has a responsibility, and that responsibility is to rightly represent the government that sent him. He's not free to go and just give his own message, but he must faithfully discharge the responsibility given to him, and that is to declare the message that the leader of that, uh, that nation has sent. And the message that God has sent forth through us to proclaim in all the world is this message be reconciled 
to God. And everywhere we go, and every opportunity that God gives us, we are to declare that message. Be reconciled to God. And the fact is that in hearing that, we go, okay, I understand that that's the message, but it sounds pretty formidable, and it sounds very difficult. And so it's important for us to realize that, that we don't do this by ourselves. We do have a responsibility. So let's talk about that for a moment. But when I talk about responsibility, I don't want you to hear that as a burden to be borne, as though God is putting a heavy weight on you and you go, I can't carry this, I can't do this. But I would rather that you would think of it as an opportunity to embrace God making his appeal through us. And the reason why you can embrace it as an opportunity is because you don't go alone. God sends his Holy Spirit with you to empower you and enable you to effectively declare that message. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, he said, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. But wait until you receive that help that you need. Today, interestingly enough, is in the Christian calendar, Pentecost Sunday. God inaugurated that by sending the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within us. And so we go forth, not by ourselves, but with that message. Even in that passage in uh, Matthew 28 that we often refer to as the Great Commission, the fact is that in that, we are told as you go, we are to baptize those who believe and we're to teach them to obey all that Christ commanded. But that that he declares there begins, first of all, by Jesus saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. So he's saying, understand, make no mistake about it, I am the one in charge, and everywhere I'm sending you, I'm in charge. They may not think it, they may not believe it, they may not act like it, but I'm in charge. All authority has been given to me. And he ends that passage by saying, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. So everywhere you go and everything you do, you don't do it by yourself. He is there to help you. And so that is our responsibility, those of us who are Christ followers. But let me take just a moment to talk to you who are here this morning and you have not yet decided to be a follower of Christ. You have not yet surrendered your heart to him. And perhaps you've been hearing the voice of God speaking to you this morning. As you are hearing him answer your question, God, what do you want me to know? You're hearing him say, I want you to know that I love you. And I want you to know that I've made a way for you to be restored to fellowship with me. And I want you to know that you can do that as you confess who you really are. Tell the truth about yourself. Speak to me about your brokenness and the reality of the separation that you know exists between us. And having spoken the truth about yourself, then turn. And turn by the grace of God to embrace my love in Christ for you and become that new creation. That's your opportunity this morning. And you don't have to do that by yourself. In fact, you couldn't do it by yourself. The Holy Spirit is helping you to do that. Do you sense him helping you to turn to Christ this morning? And so, we have our responsibilities, don't we? But isn't it wonderful that when we talk about responsibility, God really gives us the ability to respond by his Spirit. And so I'm going to ask that that is what we do in these closing moments. We're going to come to a time of invitation, an opportunity 
for you to respond to the Spirit of God as He's working in your heart. Let's pray together. If you're here today and you know that you know Christ, have you understood and have you embraced the responsibility that God has given you to go into all the world as you go, proclaiming this message to the people you encounter? Be reconciled to God. Or you're here this morning and you know the Spirit of God is drawing you to Jesus and you're seeing in Him your hope and your help. And you're going to come to make that surrender of your heart to Him. Father in heaven, I thank you for the freedom and joy of being able to declare this wonderful message from you to us. But not only this wonderful message from you to us, but this wonderful message from you through us and Lord I pray that you would find us faithful in doing that in these next moments as we create an environment for people to be responsive to you will you do what only you can do will you bring about that fruit and evidence of your working for your glory for we ask it in Jesus name and for his sake amen